experience. We are live. Today is Sunday, July 25th, 2021, which means I'm, I'm, I'm a little behind on getting other work done as we're approaching the end of the month. I'm your host, Matt Delaney. Join me this week, my very good friend, Seth Andrews. How are you, sir? Good to see you, my friend. I'm well doing, hanging in there. Awesome. I had a, uh, there were like two of your voices for half a second there, which is always fun because I got the, the little reverb thing there. Uh, we're going to jump into callers uh, shortly. Uh, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Seth, the mods will have all the information to post in chat and it should appear down in the uh, sub thing for the show. But Seth is the originator and founder and host of The Thinking Atheist and just, um, how many, didn't you just do another voiceover for another book the other day? Yeah, actually, I, uh, Dr. Joshua Bowen is an Assyriologist, which is something I would draw up at parties all the time. If I had that title, I'm an Assyriologist. <laughs> but he, he's an expert in the ancient Near East and in Old Testament Hebrew. So he writes this book called The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament. So we did a broadcast about it. I had him on the show and we were talking. And on a whim, I buzzed him, you know, a few days later. I said, hey, Josh, do you have an audiobook version? And if not, would you like one? And do you need a narrator? So we started to have a conversation. And next thing I knew, I was up to my eyeballs in narrating an 11 and a half hour audio book of the Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament. And it was an education for me because you learn how to announce 5,000 Hebrew words or, you know, Assyrian words. It was, it was easily the most challenging audio project I've ever narrated. But, uh, it's also one I'm very proud of. So anyway, it just uh, released a few weeks ago. So we've been kind of watching to see everybody respond to it. It's been pretty cool. Forgive the long answer, but yes, I just no. narrated an audio book. Thanks for no, that. It's a, it's a perfect long answer. And that's because uh, I had Josh on uh, the hang up right after he, he uh, released that book. And uh, Josh and I had actually done a team debate on slavery and a bunch of other stuff. So I was really glad to get that. There is though... Uh, today we have a birthday as part of our team here, so please watch this special message. So how Katie, much fun was that? That was, that's that was a, all awesome. Yeah, that's a that's big fun. Happy birthday for Happy me. Happy 56th as well. birthday to Katie. That's what it said on the cake. Is that wrong? Oh, we got double thank yous. Uh Happy 30th, wonderful birthday, and, and many, many more happy 30th birthdays for you coming up. May you never age. But uh, all of us would be a little bit lost if it weren't for Katie. So uh, we love you dearly, and me especially, because Katie frequently helps me out with stuff, including not non-ACA stuff. So I, I couldn't be happier to be here to help uh, celebrate Katie's birthday. But we have callers to get to, uh, and I, I, you know, I know you're not going to believe this, Seth, but we have callers who claim that they can prove God exists. Imagine that. Uh, I'll look forward to, uh, I look forward to the epiphanies that are to follow. I, I am stunned. We're going to start here with our very first caller, which may actually be the end of the atheist experience. Uh, Pratyush in uh, Tokyo says he can prove that God exists. So welcome, Pratyush. You're on with Seth and Matt. Thank you. I'm uh, happy to be here. So which God are you going to prove exists? Satan. Sorry? Uh, Satan. 
You're, you're going to prove Satan exists. Is Satan actually a god? Yes, but Satan was a fallen angel. I mean, he's worshipped sometimes as a deity, but is he a god? That's well, a good question. Uh, uh, yes, all I know about Satan is that uh, he is uh, evil and he and he is the most feared of myth mythological character. Um, um, so and and he's very uh, evil and scary. So, here, so here's um, the thing, Pratyush. Uh, no, I, uh, I heard it too. I heard it uh, too. Mythological. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm going to call absolute bullshit on this call and I'm going to hang up on you for lying to the call screeners and laying in wait because it says here that you can prove God exists, that you were Hindu, that God would create a finite timeline. And now you just told me you're going to prove Satan exists. But the only thing you know about Satan is these mythological. So you, sir, are full of shit. No, 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 no. Goodbye. You're done. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, uh, I, we've been talking. He did sort of throw a, a thought into my head, though. Uh, we've been talking recently about uh, the satanic panic. You know, I had the honor of being interviewed for a um, a Blumhouse documentary called Fall River about the Fall River murders of 1979 and 1980. And of course, this was right on the cusp of the satanic panic of the 80s right. and 90s. And you and I came out of that sort of uh, wild moral panic where everybody was playing albums backwards and, you know, they saw the devil and D&D &D dice and et cetera. We were talking about how, you know, the fear of Satan and the panic about the devil really hasn't gone anywhere. And for a lot of people, it's actually become even more pronounced. Uh, they really do feel like every generation has felt like we are in the end times. And it always kind of freaked me out because I think to myself, if you are a devout believer and you think that the end times are a precursor to the return of Jesus Christ and his reign and your eternity in heaven, I would think that the end of the world would be something you'd be overjoyed about. So the idea that everybody's losing their mind and fearful and panicked to me uh, always seems a little bit hip hypocritical, right? I mean, if you really think that, oh yeah, when Satan goes crazy and the world ends, it's going to be a precursor to the greatest joy I've ever experienced. I've never understood that contradiction. That's just the one thought that came into my head. So sorry for the digression. Yeah, no, no, no worries. Uh, so uh, since we finished the first call, I'm going to go ahead and, and do the, the regular announcements. That was the fastest call right off the bat. Um, if you're going to try and prank call the show, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's it's happened many times over the years. And generally, uh, as long as it's a decent call that's going to talk, I, I, I can't read people's mind to tell whether or not they actually believe this. Uh, but if you're going to be that obvious, uh, yeah, you're, you're not going to get much further than an introduction. Um, Thank you to everybody who's tuned in and watching us if you are watching us live. If you're not watching us live, we still appreciate you watching. But the reason I'm talking to the people who are watching live is that while you're in there engaged in chat, you can actually participate in other ways as well. For example, there's a donation link down below chat. 100% of your donations go directly to the ACA. Google and YouTube don't take any sort of cut at all. And that money goes to help produce this show and all of our other content as well. You can also visit bit dash uh, bit.ly slash aen merchandise or aen merch or no oh, it's now it's tiny.cc uh, slash merch aca anyway there's ways for you to go get your merch and i'm sure there'll be a bot in uh, chat here to tell you exactly how to get merchandise coffee cups and other things like that you can also become a member of on the uh youtube uh uh channel right here and that'll give you custom icons and it allow you to skip slow mode and stuff like that and you can also go to patreon.com slash the atheist experience to become a supporter there as well lots of different ways for you to support the organization uh, including some unofficial uh atheist experience fan facebook pages uh there's the atheist experience private group or private fan group um and then the there's the atheist experience uh super secret double probation private fan group as well. Uh, those are both up there. And there is the uh, fan run uh, discord that is associated with the program as well. Uh, th these are independently run. They're not uh, like uh, official ACA uh, sites, but you can go there and visit with people both involved with the show on many occasions and with and uh, just general supporters. So if you're finding that you want uh, community, there are lots of ways to engage in the community here. We said we take another call here. Uh, we have lots of options with people trying to uh, demonstrate a God exists. We have John in Texas who wants to know how the universe got here. Hey, John, how are you? Good, man. How you doing? I'm doing pretty well. You're on with uh, me and Seth. So, what have you got for us? 
Oh, you said uh, Seth? Yeah, Seth Andrews. Okay, I don't think I know him, but I just want to make sure I got his name correct. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I went to your, your site, and you have what do you believe, question mark, and why. And so the question comes up of, you know, how, how do we even get the start of all this, and why do you believe it didn't have a supernatural creation? So... I don't believe that it had a supernatural, or well, I, I don't know whether or not it had a supernatural creation. I have no reason to believe that anything supernatural exists because I haven't seen any evidence uh, for the supernatural. And I have no way of confirming. Like, if somebody says, hey, this just happened and the cause is supernatural, I want to know how they determined that the cause is supernatural. And so far, there's never been any demonstration of any way to detect that uh, something supernatural has occurred. All we have are people saying something happened and I'm going to claim that it's supernatural. When we go back to something like the origin of the universe, um, we don't know how the universe originated. We just know that it did. And it is a mistake to conclude that because we don't know that we somehow should be able to say it's supernatural. So, the burden of proof is on the people who are claiming they know how the universe started. And the people who want to claim a supernatural origin don't seem to have any way to meet that burden of proof. And the people who claim that it has some sort of natural scientific explanation uh, haven't sorted it out because, you know, we, there's a limit to what we can investigate right now. So we have a conservation of energy that says, you know, uh, energy can change forms, but it can't be created or destroyed. It can't happen yeah. naturally. So, John? How that is not proof enough for you on that. No, sir. I mean, no, sir. Do you, you, you said I, 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 can, I can answer this really I'm easily, John. That out there. John, I can answer this for you really easy. I'm here. The, the, the laws of thermodynamics apply within the universe. They do not apply outside of the universe. We have no idea whether or not those things are apply prior to the origin of the universe. You, you can't take a law that applies within the universe that is based on the physics within the universe and say that it also applies outside the universe. And the incontrovertible proof of this is that that would mean that whatever God you have believed in is also subject to those laws. And I don't think you believe that. Well, first of all, you're not getting around that. This is what we know for sure, and you're you're ignoring it. And John, you're saying John, the, the, wait, let me finish. Let me let me. No, finish. no, sir, no, sir. If you're going to Go misrepresent ahead. me, if I'm, I'm going to interrupt, I just explained to you that the laws of thermodynamics apply within the universe. They do not apply prior to the origin of the universe. Do you understand that? Show me how they don't apply prior to the universe, and how the universe. Got no, no, no. There, as you're ignoring. The law. You, you have to, you have to, so you need to be able to demonstrate that prior to the origin of the universe, those laws apply because they only, we only know they apply within the universe. We don't know what applied beforehand. And the thing I just demonstrated to you is, do you think your God is subject to the laws of thermodynamics? No, because that would be impossible. And I'll tell you why. John, John? Supernatural. John, you're not listening. I, I won't get a chance to talk. Correct. You you're not going to get a chance answer, to man. talk, so you're John. I'm not, John, I'm not John, you're not going to get a chance to talk because you're not listening. Does Do the laws of thermodynamics apply to your God? No. Why not? Because it shows from what we know for sure that it hap had to happen supernaturally. No, no, sir. Supernatural creator. No, sir. John, you are not Again, listening at all. Finish. John, you go, of course I'm not going to let you finish, John, because you're not listening. You're not answering the question. The question was, why don't your I, laws... I, gave, I, gave why, you why don't, I I'm going to put you... I'm going to put no, you... I'm going to put why. you... You are on hold now, John. Listen to me and shut the fuck up. When, the, when you say the laws of, the, of thermodynamics don't apply to your God, and when I ask you why, you said something about because we know absolutely this. That's not why. You, either the laws of thermodynamics apply to your God or not. You say they don't. I would agree with you that they don't apply outside of the universe. We have a, we'd have to have a demonstration of where they apply. 
So you don't think the laws apply to your universe, but to your God, but you think they apply prior to and outside of the universe, which is where you think your God is. That's what I'm trying to get to. You're what back. I'm saying is they do not apply to, he's a supernatural, there, there's a supernatural creator. There's you no don't know that. You don't know that. How do you demonstrate that? So then tell me what we don't know about the first law of thermodynamics. Of thermodynamics. The, fr- the laws of thermodynamics are irrelevant, so John. Proven. The laws of thermodynamics are irrelevant until you show that they work outside of the universe. They don't work outside of the universe. This is the universe we right. have. Which means right that you here. don't get How to... Do you John, they don't work outside- John, John, please listen. I know this is difficult for you, but please listen. You just said those laws don't apply outside of the universe. At the origin of the universe, you cannot then say that the laws of thermodynamics tell us how the universe origi- originated because they don't apply outside of the universe. And whatever whatever origin of the universe was is necessarily outside of the universe, correct? Uh, God is outside of the universe, correct. I, I We don't know. I don't know that there's a God at all. But whatever the origin of the universe is, it is not within the universe, correct? Say that again. Whatever the what origin universe? of the universe is, it is not within the universe, correct? Not within. We we know within the universe. We are in this universe, John, Matt. We are John, in this universe. John, John, shut up and listen for a second. You are not listening. The origin of the universe, whatever caused the universe, is it within the universe or is it outside the universe? It's outside the universe. Yes. Why didn't you just say that when I asked you a minute ago? And you also acknowledge that the laws of thermodynamics don't apply outside the universe. So you cannot then use the laws of thermodynamics to tell me how the universe started. Sure, I can. I just told you. No, sir, you cannot. Okay, John, you just said the laws of thermodynamics do not apply outside the universe. And now you're trying to say that because of the laws of thermodynamics, you can explain how the universe began. That is an absolute non sequitur. That is a logical fallacy. You cannot use, you, you, you want to say that it must be God and that the laws don't apply to God and that God is outside the universe. And all I'm saying is, A, we don't know whether or not there's a God. B, we have no idea what caused the universe. And C, whatever caused the universe isn't within the universe. Which, And if you say that the laws don't apply outside the universe, then you cannot point to the laws. It's like saying, here are the rules of chess. Do the rules of chess in any way tell you what the origin of chess is? That's not even, you talk about a non sequitur. I'm sorry, sir. I'll I'll let I'll let Seth try to explain this to you because um, I'm I'm sitting here explaining things. Matt, you you just keep on going on what I don't understand, and I can't explain anything. You don't understand. You what what is it you would like to explain? Because if you're going to argue, John, if you're going to argue with fallacies, why would I let you continue? So the first law of thermodynamics is a fallacy that. And no, sir. You're ab- no, sir, John. Naturally. John, the first law of thermodynamics is not a fallacy. You arguing that the first law of, ex- of thermodynamics helps explain the origin of the universe is a fallacy. I'm sorry you don't know what a fallacy is, but there you go. It is a fallacy that it doesn't tell us anything about the origin of the universe is what you're saying. I'm saying if you use the first law of thermodynamics or any law of thermodynamics... To, to, to construct an argument for the origin of the universe, you are making a fallacious argument because at, by your own admission, and I would agree, the laws of thermodynamics do not apply outside the universe. And whatever the origin of the universe is, as you've noted, must be outside the universe, which means the laws of thermodynamics don't apply to it. So what are you proving wrong with what I'm saying that it had to be supernaturally? Tell me what I'm saying that it's wrong that it had to be supernatural, and the supernatural creator is no, bound sir. by the natural law. No, sir. That were created. John. Yes. You sir. cannot Don't say. You cannot. Say, John, are you going to listen or not? John, are you listening or not? 
Matt, are you listening or not? I could throw this at you. You could you come back with we just don't know. We just don't know. We're going to forget about everything we know for what we we're, we're not forgetting about what we know. We're just admitting that there are some things we don't know and you don't know how the universe originated. Yes, I do. I know how then dem then that. demonstrate then demonstrate how you know how the universe or originated cuz you're the only one. Because I could tell by the first law of thermodynamics, it is no, sir, no, sir, no. You can't because the first no, law of okay, thermodynamics not, has well, nothing well, to do with it, the origin it, of the universe. Fine, you're muted again. I'm going to try and make this clear because we're having evidently some kind of audio issue, and you're not listening. If you claim that the origin of the universe is supernatural, how can you demonstrate that that is true? Because the law of thermodynamics proves that it's true. No, sir, it doesn't. The law of thermodynamics doesn't tell you anything about whether something is natural or supernatural. That has nothing to do with the laws of thermodynamics. Energy cannot be created or destroyed by natural means, Matt. John? You could ignore well, that to your... John? You know, the cows come home. It doesn't change that. Now, John, John, you're not listening. You're right, and now you're, you're done, John, because you're just going to keep saying the same shit over and over, and you're not listening, and I won't I waste have a question time on this. John. But go ahead, I have Seth. a quick question for John. Not that I would you know, feel included, because John doesn't even know that I exist. Just, just, I'm not just a piece of meat, well, you know, John. I know I'm a human being. Exist. I said I just want to get your name right. No, brother, I'm just having fun with you. Let me ask you this. Oh, okay. Does your God, does the God who created the universe for you have a proper name? Who is that God? Do you know? What does this have to do with creation? Of the yeah, universe? John won't, John won't answer any well, direct that, questions. That okay, hang on, that hold on, wrong. hold on. John, is your God, is the God, the creator of the universe for you a personal God? What does this have to do with? No, 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 I have a, I have a reason for asking. Are, are, I, I, you admit. I have a reason for asking. You're, is your God who created the universe a personal God with a proper name? You're, you're diverting. I, I could give you an answer. John is a not. dishonest it's interlocutor like, like who will not ask, answer questions because he it? knows he's full of shit. I don't know what else to do. I mean, I, I, know, I can't I get am. a straight answer oh, either. Okay, okay. Goodbye, John. It, here's here's where I was going with that, and I'm sure the audience is probably well ahead of me. But John is making, and he's making it very poorly, the deistic argument, the first cause argument, right? Uh, the abiogenesis argument is a variation of this. Matter cannot be created or destroyed. Therefore, there must have been a supernatural origin point for that first cell, etc., and then people begin to talk, and we see a lot of apologists do this, William Lane Craig and others. They make that sort of deistic argument about the creator watchmaker, the prime mover who spun the universe into existence. But then I always find that many people like John, and I would suspect the reason he wasn't answering is that he does hold to a specific God with a proper name, whether it's associated with Christianity or wherever. And so then you've got to take this huge leap between the uncaring, really, a deistic God into a personal God that is involved in the affairs of everyday people. And that's a whole different conversation. And what I was trying to, what I was trying to demonstrate was that even if he's trying to prove some sort of a faceless, nameless, ex you know, deadbeat dad out there that spun the cosmos into existence and then remained virtually undetectable, how does this have any day-to-day -day impact on our everyday lives? And if that deity existed and truly did have godlike powers and didn't care enough to involve himself or herself or itself with us, what do we care? How does this have any, how is it prescient to our lives in any specific way? Why would he care enough to call this show to argue for a deity that is completely uninterested in his life? That was the question that I had for John. Sadly, I don't think I would have ever gotten an answer. No, and, and the thing is, I, I tried at the beginning. Um, so first of all, I'm not saying the law, the laws of thermodynamics necessarily do not uh, work outside the universe. I'm also not claiming um, that the origin of the universe is necessarily outside of it. I was going with John's uh, model, which is we know the laws of thermodynamics apply within the universe. 
We don't know for sure whether or not they apply outside of it or before. Um, we don't have any way to confirm whether or not something is caused supernaturally. And John's, a number of fallacies, uh, one, one of the, which was John's view is that if there's not currently a natural explanation, or if a natural explanation seems to rule this out, then necessarily the explanation must be supernatural. And that's simply not true because it presumes that we have a complete understanding of, of the subjects, which we, we may not. And so it was funny to get John to agree uh, and confirm that the laws of thermodynamics don't apply to God, that the laws of thermodynamics don't apply outside of the universe, and therefore that they, the laws of thermodynamics cannot be uh, used in the discussion about the origin of the universe because they would not have applied at that point, and then have him just keep going back to matter can't be created or destroyed. Matter can't be, the, the, the laws of thermodynamics, if you're, if you're going to summarize it like that, what it should say is, Matter cannot be, matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed within the natural universe. And the thing is, that the reason I thought this was going to be simple right off the bat is that John believes that there's a God who created this supernaturally and that this God clearly is not bound to the laws of thermodynamics, that this God can, in fact, create matter. He's arguing for something that violates the laws of thermodynamics. So he's trying to both use it Use the laws to say, oh, there must be something that, that violates these laws and it's outside the universe without realizing that the origin of the universe is outside the universe. It's a double standard that many people who promote a specific deity, they say that, uh, you know, the laws apply to everyone except for God. He gets to get out of uh, yeah. jail free card. He gets to kind of move and shake in ways that are nonsensical to us, therefore supernatural. But I'm still interested in why John is so kind of interested in why he takes personally an argument about this deistic other out yeah. there. Uh, it's, and it's, uh, I do suspect he probably holds a deeper theistic belief. Obviously, that's, that's an inference. I don't know for sure. But, uh, it's, it's a little problematic in the sense that what we're, what we're talking about here is I don't know what the origin of the universe is. John thinks he does know, but he can't prove it. And he wanted to know at the beginning how we ruled out the supernatural. And the, the real issue here is, how did you rule in the supernatural? Well, we know the answer for John. John looks at the natural laws and says, oh, this dictates what can and can't happen. Therefore, if something happened and it's against natural laws, it must have been supernatural. And that is simply not a, a sound logical argument. But for those people who are interested in discussions like this, and may, may they go better, hopefully when you have the discussions like this, you'll find people... Uh, who will be willing to answer the questions that are being asked rather than dodging and dodging and dodging and twisting because they're terrified of what the actual answers are and they're terrified of acknowledging that they don't know. But there are there is a new Facebook group that was recently created, with these, which is the Atheist versus Theist Debate Group. Uh, you can go to AXP Fan Debates as well and potentially have discussions there. John can go there and maybe reformulate his argument or show where I was actually wrong uh, or maybe answer some questions for the first time. Uh, in addition to this program, the Atheist Community of Austin also, or in the AE and stuff, also produces uh, Talk Heathen and others, but Nonprofits airs every Sunday at 3 p.m. It's got new hosts and new segments. And if you go to tiny.cc slash AEN podcast, that is your one-stop destination for all of our shows as audio-only podcasts. So if you like Atheist Experience and you weren't for, perhaps familiar with Truth Wanted or Secular Sexuality... Uh, or any of those pro other programs, you can go over there and give them a listen. And the whole reason that you can do that, and the whole reason that we're here doing a show, the reason why we were able to fix robot audio that people were screaming about in chat and uh, address uh, technical problems before the show, is because we have uh, the best crew that you're going to find anywhere uh, on any shows like this. There they are right there showing themselves. Look at that. All those wonderful people doing actual work so that Seth and I can just sit here and argue with people. I have another thought. Can I throw it out? Of course. I'm interested in this assumption that a creator is automatically going to be benevolent, right? I mean, I'm interested in this idea that people take with such affection the idea that there was a creator of our universe, given all the, the suffering, right? The unnecessary, the needless suffering that we see all around us and the bad design, et cetera. People who even make the deistic argument are 
quick to assume and proclaim that uh, if there is a creator of a supernatural God that spun the universe into existence, that that God is by his or its very nature good. That's an assumption that we make. What if that yeah. God was not good? What if that God was just sadistic? Thought, hey, l- this would be awesome. Let's take these people over here and let's let's pit them against each other in a brutal jihad. You know, what if we were to send, let's throw the plague upon these people. Let's kill 200 million and see what happens to the dynamic of the planet. That'd be awesome. I mean, what if that deity was actually the first cause deity? And yet very few people, in fact, almost no one actually considers the idea that if there was a deistic God out there, that God still has never been demonstrated to be benevolent or good. Just a yeah. thought. Yeah, and, and you know, people bring this up a lot with regard to the problem of evil. You know, why why are there infants dying of cancer and other degenerative illnesses? What could they have ever done? And the the standard Christian apologetic is, uh, well, it's unfortunate, but man brought sin into this world. But but then you're just, you're just making excuses because why would God allow man to bring sin into the world? Why would God construct it in such a way that if I bring sin into the world, it causes babies to suffer immensely? While I might not be suffering at all, I might be, you know, a, a billionaire that just uh, eats and has sex all the time and never a, a dull moment and listens to the best music. Uh, if I'm the one that's that's contributing to sin in the world, why is somebody else suffering for it? That seems to be an incredibly broken system. Well, I also, beyond the fallen world uh, apologetic, I hear a lot of free will. And they throw this out as if it makes any sense at all. Right. And you and I come from the position that uh, a God who really was interested in free will would give us the best information with which to make our choices. A revelation of God in an incontrovertible form does not in any way negate our free choice. It actually gives us better information by which to make that choice. And so this idea that, well, the reason God won't or can't manifest himself or won't do miracles in the 21st century or can't do them the way they, he did back in you know Old Testament times, or the reason blah, 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 is because of free will. And I think to myself, I think my choice as to whether or not to hold to a specific deity and to be allegiant to that deity, well, that choice is better made with better information. And uh, so I, I think that pre- actually places a greater burden on whatever God that is to be there and to give me the info I need. So That, that, that gives us an opportunity here uh, to take a call from uh, Lynn in Pennsylvania who thinks that God should just be love. And uh, welcome to the show, Lynn. I'm wondering... Um, and I mean, do you do you believe in this God? How, how is it that we're in any position to say what God should be? Exactly, and that's why we are the position of God. There is. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, eternal. Lynn. I, I, I asked a question. I asked a question, and you said exactly, and then went on to say that. Th- so, is your position that is there a God, and what God is that? I believe that love is the religion and love is within us. It is up to us to expand upon that. And that is what needs to continuously happen in this world in order for us to grow. So if we can't find the love within us, we're not going to find it anywhere else. I like the sentiment. What I'm curious about, do you feel like that do you feel that we are constituting a kind of God by the manifestation of love or that God is, or love is an expression of a God? Do you believe in a supernatural God? I think is probably the, the short version of the question. Okay. If you would explain what supernatural means to you. Not abiding by any of the natural laws, a God with God-like powers. Uh, I mean, what are the properties of the God that you're advocating for? Is it just one property? Is it just love? It's a rainbow of properties. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, then, then what are the properties? Because love is love. God is not love. Love is love. So what are the other properties of this God you're advocating for? Feelings. Showing. Having appreciation and gratitude for those around you versus... No, 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 no. None of these are properties. These are things people do. What are the properties well, of this as God? Far as which, like, I don't understand properties. I don't understand. Clearly. I, I, what type so, of properties are you looking for? Well, so, Lynn, if I, if I like can jump well, in, Lynn, if, if I express love 
And if I do all the things that you had just mentioned without a God belief, how does that work? It is kindness. It's kindness. I, I, I try to demonstrate God. kindness in my life, but I don't hold to a, a supernatural God. So where does my kindness right. come from, from your perspective? From within, from sitting by yourself and evaluating choices that have been made and decisions that have been followed through with. Okay, and so it's an, an, it's an innate, work, right? it's an innate human expression, a feeling and expression that is uniquely personal yeah. to the individual, no God required. Am I tracking? Correct. Absolutely. That, then I don't know what this has to do with the atheist experience or any discussions about God, because you're not a theist and you're not talking about a God. You just are a fan of love. I am a fan of people and I'm a fan of continuing okay, but, forward but together. You, under, you understand that the purpose of this show is to address people's beliefs about gods and you don't believe in a God, despite the fact that you labeled yourself a but theist. we're removing the fact that it's people and we're just looking at the beliefs. Everybody's beliefs are different. No, no, no. So, so and we're, not we're talking about whether or not people have a justified reason for particular beliefs. Not, not, no, at no point have Seth or I or anybody in the show objected to love or uh, encouraging more love. So why would you just call in to advocate for love and claim that love is God or that you're a theist when you're not? Because I'm divinely driven. What, what, what does that mean, divinely driven? What is driving you? What is divine? It's innate. It's innate. Everything uh, that I see Lynn, in the Lynn, world around Lynn, I, Lynn, I'd love for you to actually answer the question that was asked. What is divine? Divine is what drives humans to show love. Yeah, this is just one big tautology in favor of love. And um, I, I got no problem with love. I just don't think we should spend any more time on the show about it, about this particular thing. If you thought love was a god, if you thought there was a mind behind it, if you were advocating for some particular uh, belief that, that leads to something we could discuss, that's fine. But if all you're going to do is come in and say, I, I love love, you? congratulations. Okay, no, I understand where you're coming from. Please forgive me. I need directions. I need a little oomph because this world is brutal. Um, so please forgive me. Bear with me here while I collect my words, if you will, please. Well, I mean, when I ask you what's divine, you have you have a non-standard definition for divine. You didn't seem to know what was meant well, by supernatural. You're not advocating for a god that is. I'm that it, wrong. I, 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 hang on, Lynn. Wrong. Lynn. Right. Lynn. Lynn. Uh -huh. Yes. You're not, yes. are you advocating for a God that is an, a thinking agent? I'm advocating for me, which is the God within. Uh, we're, we're done now, Lynn. Thank you. I, I, I apologize, but uh, I don't need people calling in to advocate for them. It's an odd conversation. I, I was, it's reminiscent of that, uh, the old uh, Star Trek, the motion picture where she's like, <laughs> you know, who is V'ger? V'ger is that which seeks the creator. Who is the creator? That is who is being sought by V'ger, right? I mean, whenever you'd throw something out, I was just like, what What was the answer to it's, the question? It's all love. <laughs> what is divine? Divine is love. that which seeks, which encourages love. That, and what is divine? That that which is innate. Uh, what? what? It, uh, you know, there's some, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a little, sorry, I'm a little up to my eyeballs in nonsensical arguments anyway, uh, but, uh, Having heard that, I still don't know what I've heard. It's been, you know, six, seven minutes of uh, of love exists and it's divine because it's innate and it's about the self. Uh, it's all. It sounds like uh, it sounds very new agey to me. I don't know. I, I'm gonna so. I'm gonna take this one next. It it, it may also be unusual. Uh, I'm trying to hold off on one where somebody wants to talk about slavery again. We're gonna hold off on that, but. Jackson in Virginia uh, has, uh, I guess, an issue with the Bible. So welcome, Jackson. You're on with Seth and Matt. Hey, um, it's nice to be on here. I'm actually really excited and kind of nervous a little bit. But I used to be a Christian, and then I actually sat down and thought about what the Bible defines as sin. 
and the Bible ends up contradicting itself. So I'm just going to explain that right now. So a lot of theists or Christians, they might claim if you choose to not believe or that the Bible is true, you're going to go to hell. And the reason you're going to go to hell is because that's a sin. And you also have other sins that send you to hell. But if you really look into the Bible and you look for the definition of sin, it's described as doing something that you know God would not approve of, but do it anyway. You know, that's a sin. So if an atheist, let's say, go with the um, theist's reason, chooses to not believe that the Bible is true, well, that would also lead them to not know that the Bible has God in it. And if they don't know that the Bible is God, then they don't know that all the commands in the Bible are from God. And if they don't know all the commands in the Bible are not from God, then they can't sin because they're not going against God. <laughs> no, that, that's not, rest. no, sorry, that, uh, so thank you. Uh, no, 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 you're putting me in the position of having to defend Christianity from bad arguments. <laughs> um, that what you're, what you're talking about um, is not actually Christian doctrine and not necessarily biblical. Sin is committing an act that transgresses against God and ignorance of the law is no excuse. Mm -hmm. But in Romans, it points out that God has written his law on all men's hearts. So the, the argument from Christianity is that we, in fact, know that there is a God. We know what this God wants from us. And, and it's not a matter of choosing to not believe. We are disobedient. That's what sin is. Can I, uh, I'm not actually like, like uh, supporting Christianity. I just had. To I, I know, I know it. you're, you're making bad arguments yeah. against it, which forces me to correct it. Okay. So what I'm trying to get at is like, I don't think God would like punish somebody for doing something that they didn't know that he didn't approve of. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So I have two quick questions here. One, what difference does it make what yes. you think God would do? And two, what on earth makes you think there is a God who would or wouldn't do something? I'm getting really confused because I think you misunderstood it. All right. Hang, hang on. Let me jump in. Just, Can I jump in, brother? Go ahead. Yes. If I'm okay, understanding so, you correctly, you're saying that those outside of biblical understanding aren't really in tune. We're not really on the frequency of what the Bible is trying to teach. Therefore, in some way, we're sort of, we're not accountable. It, would that be an accurate representation? Meaning we're sort of outside full understanding of the biblical God. And therefore, you know, he really wouldn't punish us because we just don't get it anyway. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, it's kind of like you hear like the age of accountability argument, like, oh, the reason babies can't go to hell is because they can't fathom the idea of God. And therefefore, they like, is, is this not a Christian doctrine? Oh, yes. Okay. All right. No, all right. no. Hang Where on. did you, you get the you... idea that babies can't go to hell? <laughs> the age of accountability is like... An the, the age of accountability doesn't exist in a lot of Christian doctrine. That is something that is, it's typically perhaps at best Catholic. And if you believe in the age of accountability, yes. you've just negated your own position because that okay. uh, reveals original sin as a doctrine. The fall in the Garden of Adam and Eve has infected yeah. billions throughout generations. We are literally born sinners, and this is what the Bible teaches, mm -hmm. right? We are born, there is no one worthy, no, not one. And therefore, we are all without yeah. excuse. These are all quotes from the Bible. So, according can to... I, go ahead. Can I restart? Because I'm, I don't really have the original one. I just like tried to summarize it, but I think I wasn't able to explain it fully. But um, uh, let me start. This show has this show has devolved into two atheists correcting another atheist about Christianity, uh, which already makes me want to go take a shower. But let's try again. <laughs> All right. So, if I was to ask a Christian what the Bible described as sin, what would that Christian say? It depends on the Christian. Well, look, 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 Christianity, look, that Christianity is, I'm going to stop right there for just, Christianity itself is yes. a spectrum. It's a cafeteria plan. Now, we can talk about the doctrine no, of Christianity. We can talk about specific basic scriptures. But we also need to talk about an evolved 
phenomenon of the religion of Christianity, where some people practice fundy religiosity, some people are Bible literalists, some are some were yesterday, some is for today, some people ignore the Bible and say it's a personal relationship, some people are Sunday Christians who know nothing, they all consider themselves Christians. So you can ask a subjective question to someone who claims the label of Christian. But this doesn't lead us any closer to what the actual fundamental tenets of Christianity are according to the Bible. Does that make sense? If, if you go to the Bible, 1 John 3, 4, for example, says sin is lawlessness. Sin is transgression mm -hmm. against the law of God. So different Christians can tell you what they think sin is. But the Bible is pretty clear, yeah. or at least relatively clear, that sin is a violation of the law. And whether or not you think you know the law okay. isn't relevant. Every For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, all are there, not all over the age of, you know. Anyway, and, go ahead. And as far as the Bible's yeah, concerned that, as well, the, the, the scriptures essentially teach that God is evident anyway. So even if you've never seen a Bible, God has manifested, the Christian God has manifested himself in creation and in conscience, meaning from without and within, you're already somehow supposed to know. We are all without excuse. Yeah, but you wouldn't know that unless you read the Bible. Oh, my God. No, can I? I'm not arguing. <laughs> I'm just trying to say, like, you have to, like, believe what you're reading is actually God. And if you believe that, then you would no, somehow you don't. know that no, this is no, you, no, 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 you don't. If you don't know what the speed limit is, you can still be arrested for breaking it, period. I know, but the difference between cops and God is God knows your heart. So he would know if you actually knew that was him. If that's a cafeteria God, look, if that's like a, a custom-made silly putty God that you just sort of decided constitutes the Christian deity, I mean, that says more about you than it would about the Christian God. And it's not in line with the basic tenets of the Christian Bible. Yeah. In well, any see, case, that's what I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I want to spend the rest of the atheist experience teaching people what the Bible has to say. I'll, I'll come back next weekend and I'll, I'll have a better explanation. I'm sorry, sir. Maybe, no maybe you'll come back next weekend, but we'll see. Maybe. I'll come back, I promise. Uh, maybe you'll come back. That's up to whoever's screening the calls and putting them on. You can come back. Whether or not you get on the show oh. is going to depend. Yeah, I just... Thanks for calling, Jackson. Been a pleasure. All right. I really mean hate. So this is something that has come up. And, and I don't know, granted, you and I operate slightly differently because I do more debates. Um, I, I am more likely, between the shows and the debates, I'm more likely to be in contentious conversations, which occasionally makes me short-fused. And occasionally, uh, it, it means that I'm going to ask the questions that they're just going to avoid answering. But I'm finding that I spend as much or more of my time correcting other atheists on their incredibly awful understanding of the Bible and Christianity and all of this. And I know some of it's because, you know, they weren't really involved with it and people in the pews don't necessarily know what's going on. Or maybe some of them were Catholic or Protestant or they came from some tiny religion. But it's like, I don't want there to be bad arguments against Christianity because that means that when people find their way out of it, uh, it's like when, when Sam Harris, he wrote a book where he said the Bible says pi equals three. And by the way, this caller, Jackson, uh, the, the call screener thing, which he never got to, was he said the, bi, the Bible argues that one equals negative one. And I was waiting for him to get there uh, because that's a load of shit. At no point is there anything in the Bible that says one equals negative one. And I'm not interested in the little word games, but Sam wrote a book where he said the Bible says pi equals three. The Bible doesn't say pi equals three. The Bible doesn't talk about pi at all. But there's a description of a well where it's three, it, 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 three cubits across and 10 cubits around or whatever it is like that. And he's like, look, if you do the math, that says that by the, the Bible says pi equals three. And there were several Christians who actually constructed diagrams of wells that would have a three meter diameter across and a 10 meter or cubit uh, circumference based on the construction of the well. So it's not even that it was wrong, but it wasn't saying anything about pi. And the thing is, there are so many good arguments 
to point out problems and flaws within Christianity. Why would we keep relying on bad ones? And why would anybody say, well, you have to believe this before you can be held subject to the law when, no, 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 it, there's a difference between if Christianity were true, it doesn't matter whether or not you know there's a God, you have, you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and you are destined for hell. If Christianity is true, it doesn't matter whether or not you know it because God's written it on your heart without excuse. If Christianity is not true, then it's all a bunch of BS and it doesn't matter what Christianity says. So it's like people are, are working against uh, themselves in, in saying, let's assume for the sake of that this is true and let me argue about how it's not. I think uh, Christianity is a great example of the proof of evolution. If you were to practice the Christianity today, the sort of happy, clappy Joel Osteen, God loves everyone. He wants God's best for you. Kumbaya kind of Christianity, you know. I'm not, uh, I'm not a fundamentalist, but I am spiritual. I don't hold to the Bible, but I love Jesus kind of Christianity. If you tried that, you know, in the 11th century, they would have burned you alive at the stake as a heretic. Yeah. And yet, so we have seen that, uh, you know, Christianity has had to evolve and stretch and become pretty much a different thing to almost everyone who practices it. Kind of a cafeteria, self-molded Christianity that fits their own worldview or their own specific needs, etc. And I think this also partially explains why so many people claim Christianity and know almost nothing about the tenets of their faith. They don't know, they can't name the Ten Commandments. They don't know who wrote any of the books of the Bible, specifically the book of Genesis, the most of the foundational book of the foundational book. They don't know Bible history. And it doesn't matter because for them, it's sort of a, a self-formed silly putty religion that they believe in belief. And yeah. for them, that is enough. It's, it's maddening, it's frustrating. And then you're right, on top of that, we find people who are non-believers in the Christian God or in the Christian faith looking from the outside in and misrepresenting what it is and what it's doing. That makes it harder for those of us who are trying to debunk the bunk of Christianity because it essentially sets us up to look really, really bad. Josh Bowen, in his book, The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament, gets into some of the biblical arguments about slavery. We like to talk about slavery, and you brought it up earlier. We talk about specific examples out of the book of Exodus, chapter 21, verses 20 and 21, but most people don't know the context of that. And so they'll get into the verses themselves without really understanding the whole of the passage. And even though they're still right on the issue of not owning another human being as property, they come off poorly because they are not prepared in the eyes of the apologist and the Bible defender. I think we need to do a much, much better job of better understanding and better uh, representing the arguments that we are for and against before we enter the arena of ideas. Just my two cents. So. Yeah. And, and a little later in the show, I, evidently, I'm told, as long as they stay on the line, we'll, we'll get to a call on slavery. That's not the one we're going to take next. But uh, as we did last week, um, here's a video clip about what you may have missed on various shows. All right. Well, I don't know if anybody else is now currently picturing Little Nas X uh, twerking and grinding against Matt Dillahunty. Uh, thank you, and you're welcome. That's so frustrating. I hate that for you. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry Oprah did that to you. We need the internet to be peer-reviewed. Peer-reviewed. <laughs> <laughs> Which I don't know how much more white Christian nationalism we really need. None. We need none of that at all. Fair. Um, okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Negative 200% on that one. <laughs> yeah. Afraid of getting infected by these variants. I send you love rings as well. Oh, I want geez. you to put your hands on your computer. I want you to touch them right now. You're scaring I me, Johnny. Please, God, tell me right now what I should say when I call into the atheist experience. And if you do not want me to do this, please tell me, don't call the atheist experience. I just, I love the clips that they, they pick out there. Uh, I just want to say that love ring sounds like something you would take penicillin for. Yeah. I, I mean, I just heard it and had that. No, <laughs> never mind. It's, what, what's going on down there? Nothing, nothing. Sorry. Just some penicillin will be okay. Love, to love rings. Yeah, sorry. I tell you what, we, there's a call I want to take now from uh, Barbados. No Rock in Barbados uh, wants to talk about God and morality. Welcome to the show. How are you? Hey, um, Matt and um, Seth, how are you guys doing? Doing well. It says here you, you wanted to talk about what God says uh, with regard yeah. to morality. 
Um, how can, how can Seth and I know what God says about morality? I mean, we can't. Obviously, we can't just take your word for it. No. Um, let me start. Let me start here first. Um, let me put my, what I believe out there. I, I believe that in the Christian God, I believe that Jesus is the was the manifestation of God in the flesh, and the laws that you wrote. He wrote for man to, to live by. I just put in that with this, you would know what it was. Yeah, I'm, I'm concerned though, Narak, because right. I'm not aware that Jesus wrote anything. How do you, how do you know that Jesus wrote something? Um, because he said that he was before Abraham. No, but that's not. No, 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 no. In no, the context no, of the no, Bible. No, 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 Narak. I asked how you knew that Jesus yeah. wrote anything. You you said that Jesus wrote the laws, and you no, now I'm asking I'm, I'm how do you know there. that Jesus? I'm getting there. I, I, I'm no, no, no. I'm asking how do, how do you know that Jesus wrote something? That's it. Oh, 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 how I know that he had a pen in his hand writing on a piece of paper. That's what you mean. That's what it means <laughs> to write something. If you if we are speaking about if we are speaking about scripture, um, scripture if you read um, First Peter one eleven, it says it was the spirit of Christ. Mm-hmm testifying of his suffering in the prophets. So when the prophets wrote, as it said in First Timothy 1, 2, 16, that everything was inspired Iraq. by God, he was Iraq. basically saying, no, I'm just saying that that is what I believe, that is what I believe that Christ And I'm, I know, I know, I know what you God believe, Narak, Narak, stop talking. I know what you believe, I'm asking why. Can you tell mm-hmm. me why you believe Jesus wrote something? Oh, because he, he said that. How do you know that he Similar said it? You don't get to claim. No, no, no. Narak, Narak, listen. You can't say that Jesus said he wrote something or that Jesus said something. You have to demonstrate that Jesus wrote the thing. I can show you a piece of paper that says uh, Trump uh, anointed me as the secretary of state. But that doesn't mean that it was actually written by Trump. And I can't just say, look, it says right here, Trump wrote it. Can I say something, no, Matt? This is not what I, I call to speak about. It was just laying out why I... That's what I believe. That 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 is just it. I'm I'm sorry that, that, that I'm sorry believe. that you don't want to answer this question, but it's kind of important because you're going to be talking about what God said about morality, right? Yes. Now I, we'll get back to the question I asked at the beginning, which is how do we know that God said anything about morality? Because we can't just take your word for it. So what evidence is there that God gave us instructions about morality? I believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. There is. I know you believe that. Itself. I'm asking why. No, no, please, 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 please stop telling us what you believe and answer the question about why. Because I, I don't know how to answer it besides saying that's just what I believe. I, I, I read the word of God. I tried you, it. How do you know I, it's I the word it. of God? You say you just said again, you read the word of God. How do you know it was the word of God? Because, Matt, this is going to go down in a lane of experiences that I know you don't want to hear. No, and it's not about experiences. You don't want to hear. Iraq, why won't you answer the question that's asked? You've told us what you believe. Now we're asking why. We do this every week. Tell us what you believe and why. What you believe and why. Because You've told us what you believe. I'm asking why. I'm asking why. Narak, are you going to let me finish? I'm asking why you believe that you that God has given you instructions of morality. That's it. You could just say you don't know why you believe, in which case we can just move on. Well, I, I honestly said why you believe, but it was not sufficient. So I, I think we should just move on. Why? You said that, you, said that you believe. You, you, you simply profess to believe. We're asking... How would you demonstrate the reality or the fact behind that belief? Why do you believe it? Because um, I'm going to go on this road, but Matt will not want me to go there. When, when there are experiences that happen in my life that allow me to believe that the God of the Bible has to be real. Just okay, so you had a, a personal experience that's unverifiable to the rest of us, that is validated for you, that, 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 that there was that, a literal that, Christ. That's what I'm saying. Can, can you let Seth finish his question before you try and answer or avoid answering? No, I mean, I just want to make sure that I'm on your page and understanding. What I'm hearing is the personal experience argument, which doesn't help anybody outside of you. And if you tell me that your personal experience is one that Jesus Christ has proven himself in some way 
internally inside the shell of you, what happens when I run into a devout believer of another religion holding to another God who tells me that they had a personal experience, which validates that for them regarding another God just as much? What do the rest of us do with you, I think is the question. I, I understand the question, but I, I, I honestly don't know any other way to answer it. So you know in a way that is completely not demonstrable or verifiable to anybody else outside of your own mind. I know because of the experiences that I had, which you just said isn't sufficient for you. But I'm not... Why would it be? Look, if I came to you and I said... I had an experience with Allah and Allah verified for me that the Quran is absolutely true and that the stories of Muhammad written about are all absolutely true, et cetera, validating Islam. And the reason it's true is because I had a personal experience and I know it's real. It's validated in my mind and heart to the whole of my being. I believe it. And I was to say that to you, would you convert at that moment to Islam? I would want to know what his experience was. You would want me to demonstrate why I believe what I believe, meaning you would want me to prove my belief or claim, right? Yep. That's exactly what we're asking you to do. Mm. Um, I was raised from young. Um, my father was a pastor. Um, so I was raised um, in a Christian background from young. So basically, um, that is what I knew, right? Well, from growing up. But I did not always live that life. I, I buy that. I then, Inherited belief is a thing, yeah. right? Your family believed. It was your family and culture. You essentially, that was your normal. And you have been raised right. essentially with a belief in belief based on the background of your family and culture, right? Family and geography, the two main determiners for religious belief, right? Here in the United yep. States, it's Christianity. It's actually, you can divide it by denominations. You want to see Pentecostal, you want to see Baptist, you go to the deep South. You want to go North, you'll find Lutheran and Catholic. You want to go down to Mexico, mostly Catholic, Eastern religions in China. You want to see Islam. It's the Middle Eastern nations, family and geography. You're telling me that your background informed your faith, but you have not validated the truth or the facts or the proof of your belief. We're asking, why do you believe it? I believe it because I, I, I do not know what else you're looking for. But We're looking for I your answer. Uh, no, 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 it, Narak, there's I not a uh, right answer. We're not looking for a particular answer. We would just like you to answer the question of why you are believed. I, I, and mo mo moreover, why should anybody else believe based on what you say? I read the word of God. I exactly How do you know that you read the word of God? I'm never, you're, you are never ever going to get to utter the words that you, shut up for a second. You are never ever going to get to say, I read the word of God on my show without me saying, how do you know it was the word of God? I read the King James Version Bible. Okay. And what I read from Genesis to Revelation was sufficient for me to believe. Okay. What was, what made it sufficient? What standard did you oh. use to determine that reading this book was sufficient to prove that what the book says is true? Because everything that I read, well, obviously when you're a child and you read the, the word of God, it seems like utter, you know, what, what was this? How can a, how can a guy be the thousand member with a job on of an ass? Or how it's not the word of God until you prove it's the word of God. I'm sorry, was he talking that, about the jawbone, the fight with the jawbone of an ass? Where the hell did that come no, from? That's what I'm saying. No, I'm saying that when you are a child and you read these things, it seems like nonsense. That, that's what I was saying. It seems like nonsense to me as an adult, too. I, oh, okay, I, I understand that. But I, would, I would believe that you would pull that. But okay, because I'm not a fan of slavery uh, and stuff. But it, that, I, think, I don't think no one is. Well, the Bible is. Here's the challenge that I have. You are, 
Okay. I think the reason the, the reason you're frustrated, the reason you're frustrated is because I think you want to tell us these foundational principles for morality as as rooted in the Christian Bible. But we see that you're using the Bible as the foundation no, on that, which you that, build that, the that, house. That's not what I was going to do. Okay, please tell me what were you going to do? I, tell me I, what I, I misunderstood. To ask questions. I literally called to ask questions about your morality and what you believe. Like, how does your morality fit? And it was just that way, basically, Leo, what mine are. Mine it says are, here, are the ones that where, do you, where do my morals come Narak, from? Narak, it says here on the call screener, would like to talk about what God says should be moral, and there's nothing objective or subjective about morality, which is incredibly confused because right. morality must either be yeah. objective or subjective. Those are the only options. But, but when, when you say that there has to be subjective or objective, that's saying then that if something is wrong 2,000 years ago, it has to be wrong today. But are you no, 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 no. You don't understand that. So objective or subjective have nothing to do with whether or not it's absolute. You are confusing objective morality with moral absolutes. That is not the same thing. But it says here you wanted to talk about what God said about morality. So and so the question immediately was, how do we, the question immediately was, how do we know what God said about morality? And you keep saying that you read the word of God and we wanted to know why. That's how we got here. Hmm. Um, all through the scriptures, there are laws written that man should abide by. Abide by. And I believe that if man follows these laws, that man would, we would flourish. Okay. Because you believe, you believe does not help me. Look, let me ask you this, Narak. Do you believe that I, as a non-believer in your God, I'm a good person. Do you think I can have morals and goodness? I believe that all the good things that you do are written in scripture. Are you saying that I have right. shoplifted a moral foundation or moral reasonings from your God? Essentially, I've sort of borrowed from your deity and that's the reason I'm good? No, I never said that you're good. I said that the good things that you do, whether you want to call it morality or, or, or what not. Well, that's, that's interesting. Not, um, that's that's, interesting. No, that's, that's right, not wait, true. That, that, that is demonstrably not true, Narak, because one good thing that I do is teach people about how slavery is immoral. The Bible does not teach that slavery is immoral. The Bible sanctions slavery. Mm, Matt, can I, can I ask you? I, I, I know you're, you're on this topic of slavery. But I don't like to go down this road, right? But I know a lot of, when you speak about morality, it comes up a lot. If you are a painter and you paint thousands of pictures, you take 999 of these pictures and you put them in the fire and you burn them. Have you done anything wrong? No. A painter can do whatever he wants with his painting. Correct. People think that God can do whatever he wants. He does not fall. On you, the sir, are absolutely vile God. and disgusting that you want to sacrifice your entire humanity to the Bill Cosby, mm -hmm. I brought you into this world, I can take you out bullshit. You don't get to say that God can do whatever no, 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 he no, wants. No. And tell, Shut up for a minute. You don't get to say that God can do whatever he wants with us because we're his property. Plus, that's not what the Bible says about slavery. The Bible doesn't say anything about God having slaves. The Bible sanctions humans owning other humans as property. You should know what the fuck your book says before you start making excuses for it, sir. Matt, I can guarantee you, I know the scriptures much better than you do. You are really no, you excellent. fucking don't. No, you fucking Matt, don't. Matt, no, you Matt, fucking Matt. don't. Because you just Matt. said that God, when I was talking about slavery, that God can do what he wants with his people. But the Bible doesn't say anything about God owning slaves. It talks about humans owning slaves. So you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. And we're done with Matt, you. Who, who gives you? Goodbye. On that note. I, I'm always a little bit struck by the position that he's God and he owes us no explanation. I think, first of all, it's a get out of morality free card. I also think it speaks to a penchant in, uh, penchant in high control religions to respond to authoritarian figures, yeah. right? He can do whatever he wants with us. I think it speaks to 
a slavery aspect of the allegiant, right? We're supposed to essentially surrender ourselves to a God holy, which essentially makes us slaves or servants of God. In fact, Christianity is loaded with that type of language, servanthood. I also see it reminiscent of the domestic abuser model, which is uh, God gives us our value. He gives us our worth and identity. We are nothing without him. You had better not ever leave me or I will hurt you. If you are harmed, it is for your own benefit. This is uh, the language of an abuser. And to see people who respond so positively to this idea that we know God can swallow us in tsunamis and he can uh, ravage us with uh, leprosy and leukemia and all manner of malady and, and horribleness. And it's okay because he's God, it's his sandbox. We're ants in the anthill kind of thing. Yep. It's uh, an alarming surrender of our own moral compass. And uh, I, I think it's also a get out of thinking free card. And I sense a little bit of that in his uh, phone call. You want, you want to do it? Let's, before we do another call, let's do a quick exercise. And, and I apologize in advance for asking you to do this without any preparation oh, or anything shit. else. I'm not good at situationals. Like, so, well, the ones you throw at me, but go ahead. So <laughs> if you were to put on your Jesus hat. Yeah, yeah. And go back in time to when you were a committed Christian. Yeah. And I said to you, why do you believe that there's a God? What, do you, what would your answer have been? Doesn't matter how good or bad it was, but what was your answer have been? Oh, I, I would have regurgitated the two big ones. Uh, I believe the Bible is true, and I just know it in my heart because I have a personal relationship. Yeah, and I wouldn't have gone down any road, any road that was dramatically different. I wouldn't have gone to the laws of thermodynamics. I wouldn't have gone to the origin of the universe. It would be, I believed because the Holy Spirit convicted me of the truth of this and I was saved and I knew it. That's it. Uh, yeah. I couldn't have demonstrated to anybody else. It's not my job to demonstrate it to anybody else. It is my job to follow the Great Commission as a Christian. Here, let me put my fucking hat back on so that nobody bites this out. <laughs> it was my job to follow the Great Commission, to go ye therefore unto all the world, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not so that I could convert people, but so that they could have the information and the Holy Spirit could convict those people that, thought that God was going to convict and the Holy Spirit could lead them to the truth. That was it. I didn't need to argue. I didn't need to show evidence. I just needed to present the case. It's, it's not even a matter of reason. It is beyond reason. It is either you are saved by grace through faith. Either God grants you the faith or he doesn't. It's not up to me to tell you or to decide or pick who God is going to, to choose. That's what it was. And if a caller would say that, I would say, thank you for that. I used to believe pretty much the same thing. Here's why that's a bad reason to believe something. Um, but instead, we get this tap dance around of, well, I read the Bible. Okay, but but why? You know, you do understand that if somebody had asked me at the time, Matt, your reason for believing, should anybody else believe for that reason? No. Well, actually, yes, they should believe because my reason is the Holy Spirit has convicted me. Obviously, anybody who was convicted by the Holy Spirit should believe for that reason, and you wouldn't even have an option. It's, it was just like, this was the truth. Well, I had a series of, you know, looking back now that I engage believers in the way that I was a believer, I see the series of trap doors that faith defenders have sort of placed out. And it's impossible to, to it really is a, a brilliant defense mechanisms, uh, defense mechanism for religion uh, beyond the blasphemy laws, you know, and, and do not dare blaspheme the Holy Spirit. I mean, you don't want to challenge this stuff too heavily. You don't want to go to hell, but we would look and say, well, you know, God is demonstrated and manifest everywhere. He is, he's a reality of science. And then someone would bring the data to us that said, well, this is not God. And we would say, God exists beyond science. He's supernatural. He can bend the laws of nature to his will. He's not bound by scientific measurement. And, um, you know, then we would talk about um, how the scripture is true. But if it doesn't make sense, it's because you need the Holy Spirit. You got to ask Jesus into your heart and get the Holy Spirit or have some sort of a quickening by the Holy Spirit in order to understand the Bible. And, you know, we had all of these weird qualifiers. We could just move the chess pieces around the board any way that we wanted. Uh, oh, you know, evolution doesn't exist. Now the avalanche of evidence is overwhelming. Well, it does exist, but it's guided evolution. And, you know, demonstrate that. 
And I, it's maddening. And I think I would have probably driven someone like you crazy when I was an evangelical because I had sort of been trained to do the very same thing. And I hear quite a bit of that in his phone call. It's true because it is. I believe it because it's true. It's it's a declaration of belief, but it's not. A, doesn't meet a burden of proof. Yeah, I've got a couple more calls here. Uh, Paolo in D.C. Um, has a view on God's existence, which um, I think we can kind of handle pretty quickly. Welcome, Paolo. You're on with Seth and Matt. How can we help? Yes. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. How are you? Exhausted. How are you? <laughs> yes. I've been listening to the show, and now I have lots of extra questions in my mind. But uh, um, basically what I, I wanted to bring up, um, I, I I was born and raised as Catholic, and, but I, I went exploring different, different areas of religion. But anyway... Uh, I think it, it would be very important. Oh, first of all, I want to say that I just found the atheist experience just recently. I think it is, a, it is an amazing enterprise because you really talk about God. I mean, you really, in one way, we are all really searching for God just by asking for a proof of God's existence. Um, Anyway, so my compliments to your work. Uh, Thank you. What I, what I want to bring up is that going back to the beginning, right, the creation of the universe, um, it is interesting, not just as a mental exercise, but also really as a tool to try to figure out if God really exists or not. Let's assume that God exists and that he created the universe. Then the question is, why did he do it? Why? No, no, no. see, Paolo, I, I can't yeah. begin with, let's assume God created the universe and then ask why he did it. Um, that uh, You don't just get to assume the, the very thing we're, we're, we're addressing here. And so what reason do we have to think there's a God? Well... I think it's just uh, the fact that we are spending like three hours every week uh, arguing and about the existence of God. Uh, I mean, we must assume something. Otherwise, what is the point of arguing about the existence of God if we just assume that God does not exist? What's the point? No, 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 Paolo. It's the point of having these discussions is because there are a bunch of people who believe and there are a bunch of people who don't believe. And the people who believe have a burden of proof. And so we'd like to get them to meet that. Both, both Seth and I used to believe, and now we don't, because we realized that we did not have a good reason to believe. I understand, yeah. So what reason should uh, we believe? Well, in my uh, first statement, uh, I, I just say that uh, I found the existence of God as self-evident, just because... Okay, well, that's that's just not true. That, that's just not true, because, I mean, it, it, it seems evident to you, but it's not evident to us. So the fact that something's evident to you, um, how do you know that what you think is self-evident is actually true? No, no, I, I'm not saying that there's a proof that can be proved to somebody who does not believe in God. Uh, uh, so, So that's not what I asked. Okay, what did you ask? Please repeat. So, if something appears to be self-evident to you, how can you tell whether or not it's actually true? Is it possible, for example, let me, let me answer, answer this question differently. Is it possible that you could think something was self-evidently true, but you could be wrong? Yes, it is possible. Okay, then the, then the next question is, do you care whether or not something is true? Yes, I care very much to find cool. out. Cool. So if, if God is, if, if you think that God is self-evident, then how can you tell whether or not you're correct? Uh, I cannot at this if, time. If you can't tell, then why would you believe? If you say you care about whether or not it's true, how can you believe something if there's no way to verify it? 
Well, I can choose to believe or I can just choose not to believe. It's, yes. it's not just a choose to believe. No, no, Paolo. No, no, no. First of all, belief is not a choice. But what we just addressed was you said you care whether or not your belief is true, but you have no way of testing it. How many other things do you believe that you cannot verify? Well, I have no way of testing it, but that does not stop me or keep trying to find out if sure. I really exist. I, Paolo, I am in no way yeah. discouraging you. I am in no way discouraging you from trying to find out if one exists. You can try to find out if a God exists for the rest of your life, but the time to believe it is after you found out not just while you're trying to find out. For example, if we were trying to find out if there was a connection between smoking cigarettes and cancer, the time to believe that there's a connection is when we actually find the evidence for that and not a moment before. As it turns out, there is a connection between smoking cigarettes and cancer. We know that from the evidence. If you're going to say that you believe that there's a God, that is the same as saying you believe that smoking causes cancer or contributes to cancer, and you're doing it while saying, I don't have the evidence, I'm still looking for it. So now you're saying you believe something, even though you have not yet reached the point where you have sufficient evidence to believe it. I understand. Can I change my statement then? Sure. What, I, what I'm saying is that I'm not sure if I believe in the existence of God. Is that okay? So you, you don't know whether or not you believe in a God. If, if you... Don't you think that if you did believe in a God, you would know it? Uh, <laughs> well, let's just say that I'm not sure that God exists. And there is no way for me I, to prove it. I'm not asking. I'll take that. Look, I'll take I'm not that, asking about though. sure. That's, that's fine. I'm just saying when you say you're not sure if you believe or not, I would argue that if you believed in a God, you'd kind of know it. But yeah, I'm, I'm fine with you saying you don't know whether God believe, exists or not. If so I now can jump in, okay. yeah, there's right. one other thing that, that I heard at the beginning of your call, and I want to make sure that I'm tracking. I sense from you, and I hear a variation off this, uh, for someone who doesn't believe in God, you sure talk about him an awful lot, meaning that it's kind of a self-conscious response. Maybe we do secretly believe. I hear from you that, hey, if there isn't a God out there, why is humankind so obsessed with these conversations relating to the God questions. Did I hear that right? Yeah. In other words, do you think our interest in the God questions kind of leans into this innate desire of human beings to believe in a higher power? Well, it is possible, but you are right, actually. We are all obsessed with the idea of God. I don't think that's correct, but but let, let me let me clarify what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but what I'm hearing is okay. if humankind has throughout our history been interested in the questions, the bigger questions, where did we come from? How did life begin? What is our purpose? That type of thing. These sort of existential questions, which we so often hear throughout the human condition. You think that that kind of searching for answers leans into the search for God. Is that accurate? Do I have that right? Uh, I, I think so, yeah. Okay. So you feel like because we are so interested in questions about where did we come from, how did the universe begin, et cetera, where do our morals come from, all of these types of things, our interest in that seems to indicate that there must be a God, otherwise why would we, we be so obsessed? <laughs> Is that right? No, 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 no. Okay. That is not a proof. It's not a proof of the existence of God. It's just a proof that we are obsessed with this idea of God. Now, no, no. I, I think we are. I, if I may, I think we are as part of the human condition. We're, we're obsessed. May not be the word. We're interested, or at least most of us are, in, in answers. And as Hitch used to say, back in the, the infancy of our species, our first answers were almost often or almost always our worst. People didn't understand germ theory. We didn't understand the cosmos. We didn't know what stars were. We didn't know what caused disease and epilepsy and natural disasters. And so people in their ignorance would reach up and look up to the skies and they would call down their deities and they would pray and chant. And they, you know, these were all human expressions in a search for greater meaning or causes for something. But the more we've come to know about the natural world, 
the less and less and less we've needed those superstitious answers, those sort of primitive answers rooted in human ignorance. And I don't think that our quest for knowing more tomorrow than we knew today, that having discussions about whether or not someone can prove a God, et cetera, none of that validates the existence of a God. It simply means we are engaged in the arena of ideas to try to determine what is true, what is real, what is false, what is superstition. Fair enough? Uh, yeah, yeah. We're interested in finding answers wherever they may be. Some people like to scribble something in a blank and others, like Matt and me and hopefully you, are saying, you're probably going to have to demonstrate that before I fill in that blank. Otherwise, the answer is, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, okay. But, and if we're, uh, if we're all fine with yeah. I don't know, I think we got to, we kind of, I kind of got to pause it here, Paolo, because um, we're almost out of time and there's one more call that I promised we would get to. But Probably I love my it. fault. I'm, no, it's not. It's fine. On, brother. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, 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 it's fine. Um, I, I, I would love for you to call back and talk about this more, Paolo, because I think if we're all in the same boat of saying, you know, hey, I don't know, uh, that should be fine. But my obsession with God, if you want to call it that, has to do with the fact that I was a believer that I found out I didn't have good reason. And then I find myself in a world full of people who believe. And for 16 years, I've been here asking, what's the good reason to believe? And nobody seems to have a good reason. And it, it puzzles me that people are so eager and willing to believe when they don't really have a good reason. But I got to move on to another caller, Paula. I'd love for you to call us back and talk another time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. I also, th I think his journey is really, is, I mean, I love the fact that his journey hopefully is about questions. God, keep asking questions. Yeah. Keep tapping on the glass. Keep kick, kicking the tires. Keep keep being curious. I think there's that. There's a lot of utility in that. There is, and I love the the questioning. But for the final call for today, we have Drew in California, uh, who says that I'm saying things about Christianity that aren't true. So my apologies if I dominate this call. But Drew, welcome to the show. What did I get wrong? Hi, um, how are you guys doing today? Well, I'm pretty good. Good. Hey, okay, so um, I, the main reason I called was I do believe, and as I've listened to a lot of videos and watched a lot of shows, that um, there has been, not necessarily just from Matt, but from the other hosts, have said things about Christianity that are not true. Um, I, I, I'm aware of that. We're really short on time. Can you get to the thing that I okay, said that okay. wasn't true? Okay, well, let's do this then. How much time do we have? Uh, about a a one minute. Okay, let's go to um, uh, First Timothy uh, uh, chapter one, verse nine and ten, which says I don't need to, I don't need to go to First Timothy because First Timothy is is a note uh, from Paul that isn't about slavery in general. It is about a slave. It, it is, is asking for the releasing. It, it, it okay. Drew. It is no. asking for the re <laughs> Drew. Drew, stop while I'm talking, or nobody's going to fucking hear you. First Timothy Go ahead, I'm sorry. is about Paul asking for the release of a slave. It has nothing to do with uh, uh, opposing slavery, and it's Paul, not God. That doesn't undermine the fact that God supposedly sanctioned slavery in Exodus 21, in Leviticus 25, and in Deuteronomy. Let's go to Exodus 21, verse 16. Exodus 21, 16. Read that. Exodus 21, 16. I know you have a Bible in front of you. Go ahead and read that. I have lots of them. Exodus 21, 16. Sure. Anyone who kidnaps someone is to be put to death. That's about kidnapping. That is not about slavery. Anyone You're skipping. If you, it, shh, Drew, 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 stop. You don't get to cherry pick verses when if you read a couple of verses down there, it talks about uh, so first of all, the first part of Exodus 21 is about Hebrew servants, who you can buy, how, how to go about buying them, how to make them your slaves forever. You don't just get to skip down to say anyone who steals another person, because now you're talking about someone potentially stealing someone else's slave. The Bible specifically says that you can beat your slaves because they are your property. It doesn't just say this in Exodus 21. It also says it in Luke 12. When in the parable about how slaves should be beaten and servants should be beaten. This is, this is what the Bible says. It says you shall own these. They are your property. They are your money in the King James and that you can pass them on to your children. You don't just get to point to a verse that says don't steal men because stealing men isn't slavery. 
Yes, where, is. where, where, where is the verse? Them. Where is the verse what? that says, "Thou shalt not said, own another person as property"? Listen, it says, "He who kidnaps a man to Drew, steal him." Or Drew, Drew, are you going to answer my question or not? Drew, are you going to answer my what? question? I can point to a buy. I can that, point to multiple Bible. Answer. Drew, shut up and listen. I can point to multiple Bible verses that say it is okay to own another person's property. Can you point to a Bible verse that says it is not okay to own another person's property? Yeah, I can give you 20 of them right now. Give me one. Give me one fucking verse that says it's not okay to own people as property. I bet you, you, you cannot. That you, would... okay, you are okay, such a dishonest 20. interlocutor. How dare you fuck off, Drew? Do I, I just want to hear, no, 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 no. hear the one I verse. You you for, but he did. He said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's the verse he went to. Of his 20 fucking oh. verses that he could supposedly produce where the Bible says don't own another human being, he, he goes to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Drew, no, I, you are a dishonest arguer, and you're not welcome back on this show. How dare you make me wait through the whole show for you to tell me how I'm wrong and then come up with absolute bullshit like that? You know, the Bible can be whatever you want it to be. You know, if you want to make it a, a bigotry book, you can. If you want to make it a love book, you can. If you want to make it a, a discriminatory book, you can do that. If you want to make it an acceptance book, you can do that. Uh, if I can throw in that slug for Dr. Josh Bowen's book, The Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament, he has a whole uh, chapter that gets into debt slaves and chattel slaves and how it's not indentured servanthood in these certain contexts and how it was expected that slaves be owned and beaten to keep them in line and to keep them submissive and doing what they are commanded to do. And uh, so don't let anybody throw out the canard about indentured servanthood. And it was actually a congenial, wonderful relationship between these chattel slaves and their masters. It absolutely was not anything other than owning someone else, owning another human being. And uh, it, I do recommend that chapter. I think he's got an actual whole book about yes. slavery in the uh, Old Testament, which I recommend to everybody. Yeah, absolutely. So Josh's book, the, the latest one, which I had him on the show about. Oh, you got is, it. Okay. Uh, the Atheist Handbook to the Old Testament. And prior to this, he wrote a book on uh, what what's, does the Old Testament, uh, does the and Bible sanction sanct yeah. slavery. Uh, and then he and I did a debate on it as well. Uh, so first of all, thank you a ton for, for joining us here this week. Uh, my apologies for, um, well, uh, dominating a call or two, because every time you spoke, the show got better. And, uh, <laughs> Whatever. And no, no, no. Every time you spoke, the show got better. And I, that didn't go unnoticed by me or anybody else. And because of that, if we got a graphic we can put up here to point some people to Seth, because there was a caller who didn't know who the hell Seth was. And that that is an embarrassing uh, situation there. Oh, uh, you check out the thinkingatheist.com where you can also find Seth's books, uh, including Deconverted, Sacred Cows, and Confessions of a Former Fox News Christian. There's a lot there, and there's a ton of content on the YouTube channel and on the podcast as well. Uh, Seth and I have been friends for years. I'm always thrilled to get him on the show. I'm reluctant to ask him to come on too often, although I'd, I'd love to hang out with him every week if I could. That's a lot uh, of fun for me, and it's always nice to get the invite. And yeah, I, I'd love to do it again someday. So have your people call my people. We'll you call. bet. Okay. Now, go play some tennis. And for all of you sitting at home who tuned in this week, uh, thank you for, for being here. Thank you for participating in the chat. If you have people in your life who believe and don't have a good reason, but love to tell, tell you about it all the time and preach at you, and you're tired of it, Point them to this show. Get them to call in and explain what they believe and why. Let them know, though, they need to bring their A game. They can't just show up and say, oh, I believe this, and I'm not sure why. I mean, they can say that, but it's not going to. You need to find out what is it that they think should be convincing. Because as a Christian, I wouldn't have found any of the, today's arguers particularly convincing. It wouldn't have fit in with my view of Christianity at the time, and it certainly wasn't something that would have convinced me. And I'm baffled sometimes that it seems that it convinces them. A last note here, I live in Austin, Texas. Austin's gone back to stage four uh, in its defense against the current pandemic due to the new variants that are out there. Uh, and I don't want us to get complacent. I'd like for us to get back to a, a normal world. I'd love to be able to interact with people and go out and do lectures and debates and conventions and have people down to the atheist community of Austin Free Thought Library um, and interact. I Please, 
please take care of yourself and each other. Follow the guidelines in your area. Do everything you can to keep yourselves and the people around you safe because we want to see you back again next week and many weeks after that. Take care.